Hi, everyone, and welcome to day two of the virtual McCormack Sport Leaders Forum, brought to you by our title sponsor, Scout Sports and Entertainment. Like yesterday, we have a very exciting lineup in store and are looking forward to getting started. Thank you again to all of our sponsors who are powering each of our sessions, our lovely advisors, the McCormack Department of Sport Management, and all of you for showing up and being ready to engage with our speakers. Keynote today is Jessica Gelman, who is the CEO of Craft Analytics Group, and will be moderated by Michael Newman, who is the founder of Scout Sports and Entertainment. Um, this keynote is powered by PointsBet, so thank you, PointsBet, for your support of our event. And now I turn it over to Michael to get started. Thank you, Emma. All right, good morning, everyone. As founder and managing partner of Scout Sports and Entertainment, and also the presenting sponsor of the conference, I could not be happier for all of us to be back together for taking a hiatus last year. For our industry to move forward, it's important fans safely return to sports venues and conferences like these find a way to happen. So first I wanna recognize the work of Professor McKelvey, Will Norton, Emily Must, Marissa Randall, and all the student leaders, plus my staff, and especially our UMass alums, Scott Saverin and Jack Nordy. I've been counting the days to today's discussion with Kraft Analytics Group CEO, Jessica Gelman, which was launched back in 2016. She's gone on to become an all-world disruptor in sports, also creating the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference, and has been showered with many industry athletes, <laughs> including, but not limited to, 40 Under 40, the Power 100 Women to Watch, and Game Changers Women in Sports Business. She's a double graduate of Harvard and also played professional basketball overseas. It's truly my pleasure to share the virtual stage this morning with Jessica. Welcome. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. And Michael, this has been a great excuse to get to know you too and the great work that you guys are doing at Scout Sports and Entertainment. So, uh, so pleased to be here. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. I've enjoyed uh, getting to know you as well. And uh, I, I think we've created a a, a good marriage for, for future collaboration. Okay. Um, so let me jump right into it because one of the things I loved about our conversation last week is you telling me about your time growing up in Chicago during the era of Michael Jordan and how you fell in love with basketball, especially playing the game. But you had a challenge. Nobody in your family shared your passion for basketball. So you actually had to self-taught yourself how to play the game. What, what was that like and, and how did you do it? And, and you went on to become a very competitive player. So you must have done a lot of things right. <laughs> you know, I was really lucky. And I'll start with the story of when I tried out for my sixth grade basketball team. Uh, and it was the first time I'd ever played basketball. And I had been a competitive soccer player before that. Um, but I, I love the game immediately. And I wanted to be on the team so badly that I actually asked the, the coach if, um, if I didn't make the team, could I be a manager? So I was trying out for the sixth, seventh grade team. And just for perspective on how little I understood about myself, I ended up starting on the eighth grade team as a sixth grader and wow. was, was getting score on the team. It wasn't a lot of points, by the way. The first time I shot a free throw was in a game. Um, and I somehow bricked it in. But um, just had a real love and passion for the game. And, and that's true. My, my, uh, no one in my family played uh, basketball. I did grow up in Chicago, so had some early exposure to Michael Jordan and was influenced to the, the experience of his influence across really every, all of the NBA. Um, but the way that I took out to learn because I didn't have someone teaching me, and again, like even though I didn't have someone teaching me, it didn't mean that my parents didn't afford me great opportunities to um, go to basketball clinics. And I actually started going to a local basketball clinic for boys, which was amazing for my confidence. There were girls clinics at the time. Um, but I remember the first day I went to the clinic, they said, uh, there's this drill in basketball called the spider. For those of you who play basketball, and they said, no one can do this um, in their first year in the clinic. And that was basically all I needed to hear. I practiced it that whole week, and I was able to do it the next week when I went back. And so I think like when we talk about learning and how do you learn and, you know, are you going to be able to, because the whole process of life is about self-education. And while you're in kind of going through pretty much through the end of college, there is a set path. 
and you you know you go to each grade and here's the expectation and it's pretty clear but i think i always had this natural affinity and interest a natural curiosity of um how i could make myself better and kind of was naturally oriented that way so um i asked lots of questions maybe to the point of annoyance of some of my coaches um, i watched as many games as i possibly could so i could learn uh, I read books about it. I, I mean, I was really just what you would call a student of the game and a gym rat. Mm -hmm. And that's been very, very consistent for me in my career. So um, as you alluded to, I, I did go on to play basketball at Harvard and then professionally over in Israel. And each step, step of the way, you probably, if, if any of you guys are basketball fans, you hear about um, the professional NBA players because that's where you'd hear it the most they actually pick up or have one focus of a new skill they're going to add in each of the off season. And I think most people should and, and do think about that in their own professional life. Mm -hmm. But I think about the job that I do today at Kager, which, you know, we, we rolled out of crafts and entertainment uh, actually almost exactly five years ago, but all the roles that led up to Kager, which again is a technology and analytics company. I mean, I never run a technology and analytics company. So that was, all new to learn how to do that. And it was the same process. I talked to people, I read books, I watched videos, I listened to podcasts. Um, when I took over running ticketing for craft sports and entertainment or retail, or even just doing marketing and kind of building up the function of marketing within uh, the Patriots many years ago, none of those things did I know how to do before. So this process of learning and learning how to learn, I guess, and being a student of whatever game you're playing. So when I was young, it was basketball, and today it's business and, and right. sports analytics. That's really been one of the great lessons for me, um, you know, in as a result of sports that's really carried through to everything I do today. Right. So I, I love how you were able to draw comparisons to starting your own company and the early days of, of playing and competing. And when you, um, when you read books and you read manuscripts and you listen to entrepreneurs talk about what those early days were like, there always seems to be a focus on failure, what I learned, um, what was self-taught, um, and what I took from the environment. And it sounds like you did an incredible job of transitioning those key learnings as a competitive basketball player into a lot of the entrepreneurism in your career since Harvard Business School? You know, it's very much the case. I think that learning how to fail, and I think what's so great about sports is that you can fail very publicly. Mm -hmm. So I think we all have some small failures on a day-to-day -day basis, sometimes really big failures uh, in our careers. And it might be one person notices or five people notice, or if you're publicly fired, of course, uh, that would be a very public way. But it, in sports, like if you win or lose, um, it, it can be very specific. But I think the how you react to failure is actually the more important learning than the fact that you fail. You're going to fail. To me, failure is a form of feedback. And so I actually did a class last night, last night with the UMass students. It was focused on women in sports. And I shared a little bit about this failure experience that uh, my college basketball team had where we lost the last game of our um, of our season and if we had won we would have gone to the NCAA tournament and mm. won the Ivy League title. Wow. It, was a, it was a home game and we, it was all students who came which is very unusual um, in the Ivy League and uh, we not only did we lose but we got just embarrassed. We, we lost very poorly. I think the the results of that and how people internalized what we needed to do coming together as a team <clears throat> carried through to us having enormous success after that. We won by an average of 25 points in league for the next two years. We went on to go to NCAA tournament twice. We won back-to-back -back Ivy League titles, set a record for most wins, consecutive wins in the Ivy League. And so again, I think when you have that kind of experience in early in your life, which I, and that's an example, I've had many more since then, but then again, in the business world, I'll give you a, a good example here at, at Kager, um, when we first spun out the business, the intention is that we were going to have a partnership with a company called Learfield. Mm -hmm. And we created a joint venture with them called Clear and Tell. And then we were going to go and partner with them in taking our product to colleges. And, you know, we learned, and this was five years ago, 
college sports is pretty far behind professional mm -hmm. sports. And even within the professional sports world, the different leagues are um, are behind. By high, sorry, I'm, when I mean behind, I'm talking specifically about the use of analytics to drive decisioning right. and understanding what data and technology and analytics can bring to bear to help create a better experience for the fans. Um, so, I mean, the that was like a huge promise of Kager. And guess what? We shut it down after a year. And so many people would say, oh, that was like, learning or knowing that that wasn't going to work was actually a success. But to me, in many ways, it was a failure that we hadn't, you know, didn't have the understanding of how we were going to bring something to bear in year one. Now the business is going great. So uh, that's, that's important too. Like, how are you going to learn and pivot and alter moving forward? Um, so just to share that too. Yeah, no, that's a really important point. Um, you said something just before that I'm going to get back to. You talked about sure. how when you're an athlete, you play sports, you can fail publicly, right? And and my next question, I have something else I want to touch on first, but my next question, sure. I want to talk to you a little bit more about sports performance under pressure because that really was um, uh, an early passion of yours. But I just want to touch on one more thing about sure. uh, sports and business. Um, sure. And a lot of people probably know if you played professionally overseas in Israel, like what's that one crazy story that um, you, you have that seems like all basketball players or professional athletes are asked that question when they've spent time overseas. I'm not going to ask you that question. Maybe we'll do that later. But the thing that I'm mostly interested in, because um, a lot of people know that I have an affinity towards hiring athletes at Scout um, or competitive dancers or, or people that worked in groups growing up. Uh, people that were uh, uh, actors, people that were public speakers, people that were on the bait team, people that perform at a high level. You played at the highest level. You played in the Ivy League. You played professionally overseas. A um, lot of students today uh, in the audience uh, probably play, you know, very high level sports or or play club sports or weekend wars. What what quality attributes are really necessary to succeed at levels? What do they need to take away from there? college career, what attributes that they can apply to their career? Because a lot of the students today are going to be looking for jobs and going to be in the in the workforce just in a few short months. Yeah, so there's three things that I would speak to on those lines. The first is what you what you said, I agree with 100%, which is um, dedicate yourself to something, anything. That is important. Being able to work through and learn is like one of the key things that we talked about. And being able to do it within a team and kind of push yourself a little bit further is is a really critical learning that you have. And it doesn't need to be sports. It really can be anything. But I remember my first job, um, I did consulting coming out of college. And there were, I remember like the the partner was like, okay, we're gonna have to all nighter. And I was like psyched about it. I was like, sweet, this is gonna be cool. <laughs> like we're gonna work together. And right. like the other people on the team who weren't athletes, they like freaked out about it. I was right. like, it was just so a weird thing for me to kind of realize. And I was just like, well, this is just something we're going to do together. And that was part of, um, you know, what I had grown up doing. But the two other things that I think that for me anyways, sports really afforded from an attributes and kind of quality trait that I, that I think taught me first and foremost is questioning the status quo. I was on yeah. a lot of different teams that um, did things for the first time. And especially today, like even in what Kager is doing, we're building and doing things for the first time in the sports industry. Uh, I like being in that position of creating new things that are innovative and driving change. But I think if you back to, even when I was growing up as an athlete, the things that I did, um, like I, I would dribble behind my back, which at the time, girls didn't really do. Uh, and you can kind of see that carrying through being like a woman running a sports analytics tech company is not necessarily something that is all that common. Um, the other kind of key thing there is that I was a point guard mm -hmm. and I played on amazing teams. I, the, my teammates were, uh, were very talented. Um, one of them legitimately was the best player to ever play in the Ivy league. So that didn't hurt why we were so successful. She's now, um, she actually worked for the Celtics, um, and is vice president of player personnel mm -hmm. there. But, um, but my job was to understand the strengths and weaknesses of my teammates, where they were good, where they were weak. If they were injured, what did I need to do to adjust in terms of if they had hurt their ankle, like what did that mean in terms of how fast they were relative to how fast they were normally? Or if they were right. a, a forward who didn't have great ball handling skills, not on the ball um, right. at half court, getting right. them the ball in the post. And so the right. same thing carries through 
today, like my job as CEO, while it's not, I'm not necessarily always on the floor playing because I do have a lot of a coaching kind of role now, but it's to identify where people's strengths and weaknesses are and where they're and where they need to shore up some capabilities. And that can be through a variety of means. That could be direct feedback to them. That could be training. That could be providing um, support with other people around them. Um, but that's a big part of what I learned how to do, or I guess I would say started to think about very actively, especially when I was in college. Mm-hmm. Um, and a big credit to my college basketball coach, Kathy Delaney Smith, for um, calling me out on that. Send messages with your path and passes. Give confidence to your teammates, and right. also under, understand where they're where they're weak or strong. So, those are a couple of the the three qualities: questioning the status quo, setting others up to succeed, and then um, dedicating yourself to something. Yeah, that's great. I love that. I think we have a very similar mantra at, at Scout. I love how you played the cerebral the cerebral game. It sounds also like when you were a point guard, you were really playing. You were playing chess when others were playing, you know, checkers. And the other thing that you said earlier, which I absolutely love, you just talked about in the offseason, players need to work on something that they're that they need to improve upon. So when the next season comes around, they're better. We um, at Scout, we're always pushing everyone to get about 18 months of experience for every 12 months that they work for us. You know, so if there's in, they got close to five years worth of experience, and we we push everyone to get uncomfortable with things that they're not familiar with. So let me now go back to what I wanted to talk to you about sports performance under pressure. Um, I really enjoyed our time last week. It was really great to talk about your journey, your early life. Sure. And what I learned was that early life played such a critical role in your eventual migration into sports analytics. You defined it as a super important part of your evolution, if I remember correctly. I was personally fascinated by your own fascination of sports performance under pressure which you alluded to before. Can you talk to us about how that impacted your time as a student athlete at Harvard? Like, what was that exact moment that caught your attention? And then what did you set out to accomplish? Well, so I, I, like I said, I grew up outside of Chicago and uh, was a huge fan of Michael Jordan and saw how he would, you know, hit all these game winning shots. And I was lucky enough that a couple of game winning shots. I also missed a couple, a lot. Um, but I, I started to think like, what are the characteristics and like, why are some people like want the ball in pressure situations and are going to be successful and not have fear? Uh, and why do other people in those situations? And so, um, again, as you kind of alluded to the cerebral component, uh, I wasn't the fastest. In fact, I was quite slow. I wasn't the most athletic. I had pretty good hand eye coordination, but I really, had to get advantages where I had strengths and that was on a lot of it was the mental game <clears throat> and so what I did when I was in, when I got to college and there wasn't a sports psychology track uh, at Harvard but Harvard had a very statistically ex- experience oriented uh, psychology department and so what I what I ended up doing is running an experiment on a local high school boys basketball team my roommate my college roommate was um, her dad was the head coach of the team and basically created um, an environment of, of a pressure situation and a non-pressure situation, or as we call in marketing today, a test and a control. Mm-hmm. And so the test was, um, or the control was, what is the student's average or the, the, the player's team? What is their normal free throw percentage? So they would shoot hundred free throws a week and that was the control. And the test was at the end of every practice, they'd shoot a free throw um, and if they missed the free throw, the entire team ran a wind sprint. If they, if they made it, they didn't have to run. So it was basically creating a pressure situation. Right. And, um, again, the key thing here is that it was about, um, running an experiment, identifying characteristics of people who perform better in this pressure situation than their control situation. And, um, I just, you know, I, it was a little bit like me trying to, be better in games as well, obviously. But I also was just like, this is so interesting. And there had been no work done on this at that time. Um, You know, what is interesting and surprising is that learning to think like that with the testing control, identifying correlations obviously became the baseline for how I started to think in in the business world um, over time, because that is a lot of the work that I'm doing uh, with the Patriots, which created a lot of differentiation and that we've extended to Kager um, 
and from a technology and automation perspective. So, yeah. So, so it's interesting that you're doing all this work. First of all, to say now I feel better that when I coach my son's rec basketball team, I make them run a sprint down and back before they take their foul shot to get their heart rate up. <laughs> so they're mimicking what it's gonna be like in a game situation. So it's better that I do that because you would, you would approve. But um, so Harvard is quint quintessentially a school that's rooted in numbers. Mm -hmm. And you just shared your strong affinity to statistics. Um, you're doing this study this obviously laid the groundwork, the early assignment at Kraft. Um, can you talk about that? Yeah, no, I, I think this is actually a really interesting connection that yep. when I was looking to go into sports uh, coming out of business school, was, which is when I made the decision, I kind of to get some skills first in the business world and then um, so that I could apply it to help moving the sports industry forward. Uh, but there was an opportunity probably three or four years in um, from a data perspective. Just so I started with uh, for the Kraft family in 2002 and uh, to date myself a lot, Facebook didn't exist then, uh, emails did not have your name attached to them, they were not personalized. Um, you know, Amazon was like kind of still selling books, uh, not the widespread impact that it has, including owning Whole Foods today. So um, there was a lot of, net new data that was becoming available and uh, an opportunity to kind of get this over our view of a customer and that's mm -hmm. someone and that's how many emails are they opening what tickets do they have how long have they been a season ticket member and trying to predict and project customers who might not remain a customer it's people who may not renew as we call it in the sports sports world and so kind of the first effort that we took, and I think this is really interesting because it is a test and a control, was around trying to identify, and this is very common in sports tape, but when we did it, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it was, no one was doing it. Mm -hmm. But um, can we identify the behaviors that indicate that someone may not renew their season tickets? So we did a predictive mo model, mm -hmm. and it was not very complicated. It was a simple logistic regression and identified a couple of different things that were indicative of that a, that a customer might not renew. The most significant was if they didn't attend games. Isn't that surprising? Uh, no, it's not at all, right. but right. the interesting data point and then the prescriptive component about it is what are you gonna do? The interesting data point is um, once they got to the fourth game of missed games and this is out of eight, so basically half the games, their likelihood to renew dropped by 35%. So you our intention was how do we prevent them from getting to that fourth missed game? And this is where the test and control comes in. So what we did is we set up a series of communications and outreaches after the first missed game, after the second missed game, and after the third missed game. So we were kind of coming in and trying to adjust and make sure we understood what was happening. So did they miss a game because they had a personal situation that came up or did they miss the game because they had a bad experience? So getting feedback from them, make sure that they knew if they weren't gonna be able to come to the game that they could um, you know, sell their ticket on the, the secondary market. So like those types of efforts. So we did a test and a control across all of these communications and the, the customers who got communications renewed at 5% higher than the people who we didn't do anything. That's impact and that's mm -hmm. data driven and it's a test and it's an experiment. And that was kind of the start of seeing, okay, we can use data to understand our customers and then we can use marketing and communication to alter those behaviors in the ways that we want to educate our customers, not in a negative way or nefarious way, but to help them understand the amenities that they receive and have. Right. So, so, so very early, you're working with one of the industry titans in sports. You're working with, with an icon, Robert, Robert Kraft. And he is an icon, you're right. He is an icon, <laughs> with, with, without a doubt. And he's certainly one of the big winners coming out of the new NFL media deal, because if I remember correctly, I think he heads that committee. But when, when we talk to executives, senior executives that are, that are making uh, an impact in our industry, one of the questions that students always want to talk about or, or they want you to talk about is, you know, was that 
was that your aha moment where the door was opened and you realized, okay, I'm going to jump through this because no one's jumped through this before me? Or was it a fork in the road moment where you went one way and that propelled you down this path, right? This journey that you've been on to start Kager, to be involved with Sloan, which we're going we're gonna to get to. But like, talk about the role that, that this opportunity and, and Rob Kraft has played in your career, because not many people have a story like this. Yeah, so uh, I, was really, <laughs> I was really lucky, I guess I would say, in that the year I was graduating from HBS and, and Robert <laughs> is an alum of the school and very philanthropic fellowships, which I actually didn't have one of his fellowships, but Gillette Stadium was being open that year. Uh, and for those of you who want to, who are interested in getting in, into sports, going and working for an organization that has a major transition change, like building a new stadium. I mean, I obviously didn't think about that or know that then, but that is really a good opportunity. So the crafts happen to be looking for a field study, a team to basically do a project to help them with a business issue. And um, my team applied. It was a couple of one college teammates, actually, and then one of my close friends who I was co-president of the Business of Sports Club. And um, we did our we did the project. Our main contact was Andy Wozniak, who was the COO of the Patriots at the time. But the, Robert and Jonathan were both very involved in our readouts, and um, we gave our final presentation. So uh, we're obviously here in Massachusetts. Gillette Stadium, by the way, is right there. That's why I looked over there. Uh, and it was basically on how best to maximize the use of the stadium, in particular the club space on non-game days. And we effectively wrote a business plan mm -hmm. and did a lot of primary research, very data-driven, of what, how many people would potentially use the, uh, the venue, how far would people drive, would people from Boston come out. We did comparative um, studies with other NFL teams that had club space and what business were they generating from it. And then, I mean, so it was cool. It was a great experience to kind of tie my business school together. I did it mostly because remember I was a basketball player. I did basically to have an experience in sports. Mm -hmm. I did connect that it would lead to a job, um, which was kind of like the dream to be working for um, thought leaders like Robert and Jonathan Kraft, who are innovative and entrepreneurial and, you know, really thinking differently about sports and business. Mm -hmm. and treating sports like a business and not like a hobby. And so um, we gave our final presentation. <clears throat> and as I was walking out, they asked me if they could help open any doors in sports. And uh, then, a, then a couple of days later offered me a job. Uh, and I would say it was almost 20 years ago. And if you would have told me that I would still be working for the Kraft family, I would have said that's crazy. Uh, but that said, like the, I've probably had eight different jobs. And I do want to talk. So I think it was a fortuitous situation, of course, that they happened mm -hmm. to be looking for a field study. Um, but also, like, we did a great job. And I you know, can't thank my teammates from that project enough who have all gone on to be very successful in, in their careers, I'll, I will just add. Um, but that, 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 was, that was fortuitous. But sometimes you also make your luck by doing the hard work and right. pushing yourself to do better. I think so that was definitely an aha moment. But I think the fork in the road moment, if I can speak to that, because you think that also happened, which was um, in uh, in 2000 and what year is it? 2012 or 13. <clears throat> I was very frustrated with the with the challenges that we were having with our technology and ability to get access to data for the work that I was doing at the time for craft sports and entertainment. And that was um, on the marketing side, on the ticketing side, on the retail side, on the stadium operations side, on parking. It was just very challenging to pull that information out. It was very manual and um, this, there were no good solutions that were out there. And we needed basically to have a massive change in order to go where we wanted to in the future. And so um, I did a bunch of research for probably six, seven months. So going back to that natural curiosity and trying to make things better and educating myself. <clears throat> and then I put together basically several page document of here are the issues that we're experiencing today. Here's where you know, I think we need to go. Mm -hmm. Here's a two year plan for us to do this. And if we're gonna make this kind of an investment to create our own platform, to automate our processes, to create standard KPIs, also this can be something that we that we spin out as a business. And the crafts had been encouraging me for many years to think about uh, potential opportunities like that. 
they weren't like, hey, Jessica, think about this. It would be like a passing comment. It wasn't like this, it, just for like, and I think that's important mm -hmm. because a lot of times I don't know if people hear the little comments or like internalize them. So, um, so then basically the next day it was like, let's go. And it took a while because we had to build the platform internally for first. And then we ended up officially spinning out in five, five years ago, as, as we have mentioned, but, um, you know, that was really like a big fork in the road where, mm -hmm. you know, I could have continued on this path to, to running a team effectively at some point, or, you know, in this case, building something that could potentially have much more impact, which five years ago, I didn't know when we spun out and we were 10 people, I didn't know that we would be working with the NFL and having a platform that every team in the league was on. I didn't know that we were going to be working with the Philadelphia 76 mm -hmm. Sixers or the Sacramento Kings or on location. I didn't know that we were going to do work with Amazon and Ticketmaster, but like it took the scope of potential to have impact and do really cool creative things. Like that was a huge fork in the road. And I mean, lots of challenges, lots of failures, as you can imagine, as you've experienced yourself doing uh, startups, but like it's worth it because of the learning and growth. Right. Um, your relationship with Jonathan and, and Robert is, is very different from, from mine. We, we did a great deal with them many years ago. We, we created entirely new real estate within the venue for, for one of our clients. As a result, um, the clients and us, we get invited. We, we go up for a Thursday night game and the hospitality was great. We're on the field. Um, we're in Robert's party beforehand, which mm -hmm. I'm sure you've been to a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And I want to meet Jonathan because Jonathan and I have a mutual friend, somebody that I grew up with, moved to Boston, became a successful business person. They sat on a board together for a charity. So it's October. It's a cold night. I walk in wearing a ski hat, you know, probably a little bit heavy jacket. I walk in. Um, Robert says, hello. We start talking. And then he said, I'd love for you to meet my son. Have you ever met my son before? And I said, no, I'm looking forward to meeting Jonathan. We have a mutual friend. So he calls Jonathan over. And he introduces me and he says, this is Michael New. He runs Geico's agency and, oh, yeah, that's a great deal that we did. And he said, oh, he goes, I'm so happy that my father introduced me to you because when you walked into the room, I wasn't exactly sure which former player you were. <laughs> and I have to tell you, if I ever write a book like Confessions of a Serial Sports Marketer, which I'm putting the outline together, I have so many stories like that. But like that one as a former, like, high school football player and college lacrosse player, like for, for him to say that, all right, but I'm digressing. So let me let move on. Cause you sorry. mentioned, yeah, you mentioned the Philadelphia 76ers and I'm going to go there right now. Sure. So in your early years at Kraft, you're invited to guest lecture at MIT through a friend who at the time was an executive with the Boston Celtics. His name is Daryl Murray. Daryl goes on to have a long career in the NBA. Um, he was right. He was in the middle of a big situation uh, you know, a year and a half ago, he's currently with the Philadelphia, currently with the Philadelphia 76ers. He eventually asks you to teach with him at MIT. So I look at this as really one of the historic moments in sports, right? This is really behind the scenes because it leads to the creation of the MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference which has been a major disruptor. We talked about this, a major blue ocean opportunity, major disruptor in the sports conference landscape. Take us through those very early conversations. Sure. What were you guys setting out to accomplish? Did you think in your wildest dreams that people like Adam Silver and Steve Ballmer, Ted Leonsis, President Barack Obama and others of that level would ever come and speak there? Uh, no. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I used to start, I mean, Daryl is one of my best friends. Um, and so we, we developed a great friendship. He started at the Celtics basically uh, a little bit after I started working for the Kraft family. And he, uh, he was teaching the class at MIT and he knows this. I went to listen to the class because I wanted to learn a couple things. So again, back to this curiosity right. and see what I could take and apply to, to what I was doing. And, um, and so then, yeah, he asked me to come and teach the class with him. And we were actually teaching us when he started to get the uh, opportunity with, with the Rockets. So I think just like that's important to note that we were in process in the class. And this was in like 2004. Um, and, you know, he when he first got the, the, the job, 
he and I were like really into the class and enjoyed teaching it. And um, it was fun to give back in that way at that time. So he, he actually said he was going to fly back up every week and teach the <laughs> class with me. And, uh, and, and we were after the women's final four having a drink at a bar. Um, it was in Boston. Sorry, just to be clear. And he, he was like, telling me, I was like, Daryl, like, you're going to have to be totally fist on your, like your job. Like you're just, that's going to, you're not going to have any time for that. So, um, he's like, well, what do you think? And I was like, well, like we bring people to class all the time. We could just like do a conference, like we mm -hmm. something like that. But it was kind of like a throwaway comment. I and mean, it was like, oh, that's interesting. But it was, it wasn't like, let's do this. And then, um, and then he, and then he called me up like a couple months later. He's like, you know what? I think we maybe should do this. And I was like, yeah, do you think we could like use the students from the class to who had been in the class so that they can continue to learn and have exposure? And so that conference, we basically spun up in like four months, mm -hmm. uh, like September, I think, or in um, the conference used to be earlier. It's a little bit later this year. Um, and it was like 100 people, maybe 125 people at the first conference. Like a bunch of them were just my friends because we were having this event and it cost like $25 to go to it. And it was on the MIT campus and it was snowing and people were walking all around campus and we had directionals. It was awful. People, I mean, it, I mean, it was awesome, but it was awful, but right. it was oper operationally awful kind of wise. Awesome. Uh, in fact, like Bill James at that conference, um, like wrote his email address in chalk up on, um, in, in one of the rooms, like looking for feedback. And so I think like, the the initial kind of interest there was probably five students maybe six students who were involved in the conference at that point in time and then it just grew very organically because this, you have these students who wanted to learn and do be, do more and better than the year before and then it was a little bit like daryl says it was like catching hold of it and like holding on to it like the the rise of the amount of data that was available the interesting work that had happened in baseball that mm -hmm. Daryl was starting to drive on the biz, uh, sorry, on the team side for basketball. And then of course, all of the new data that was becoming available on the business side, it was just one of those kind of um, growth that we were kind of part of helping to spearhead and creating this form for people to think differently. I think what we started to do also is that not only were we having people come and speak, but we created a lot of areas for innovation to happen. We created like a research paper competition um, <clears throat> where people got hired out of that into roles running running the, the team side for sports organizations. Um, like Kirk Goldsberry, if anyone really closely follows it, he won the research for competition while he was a professor at Harvard and then went on and was hired by ESPN and the Spurs and works has, you know, I think he worked at The Ringer for Bill Simmons too. So, I mean, there's a lot of people that were like, founded at the conference and you had a lot of like-minded people coming to the conference. There's been, <clears throat> I don't know, probably like three or four companies, people who met at the conference that then formed companies out of that. Um, and then there's a bunch of Second Spectrum, which is a huge organization, one a huge business in, in Snow. Uh, they do all the tracking in the NBA. They won the research paper competition. Uh, we, have a, we have a startup competition that we have done for I think 12 years, mm -hmm. uh, a, a company called Noah Basketball which is now being used um, very prominently, won the start competition. So, I mean, I think it's just also this like very positive reinforcing um, environment that we've created. And so that's, it's really fun. And the other thing, the really unexpected thing, like the speakers coming is amazing and we're so lucky that people come, but how many students who ran the conference are now working in sports? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just like super cool. And there's a great, um, you know, a great alumni base who come back every year. We rolled out a mentorship program this year, and it's all former um, student leads who are mentoring uh, the underrepresented populations, uh, women and an underrepresented groups uh, trying to open the funnel in sports, but it's former student leads who are being the mentors. So it's just, it's, it's, a, it's amazing what it's become. I'm mm -hmm. very proud of what it's become. There's a lot of people who have been involved in creating uh, it over the years, and I'm just glad that it is having so much impact and changing how people are thinking. I'm so glad you said that because one of the reasons why we were so drawn to partner with Mass for this conference is I love that it's student-led. I mean, Scott Saverin, who works for us, I mean, he's running cross-channel analytics for Scout 360. I mean, he was involved putting this on years ago as a, as a student at UMass, and cool. you take a look around 
the sports industry and it's just littered with people that have been involved not only with this program but with this with this conference and the the leadership and the logistics and the managerial and the experience the that you like. were offering the skills you were offering people at, at MIT and what this at UMass are getting is is second to none um all right, so I'm going to ask you a couple of quick industry questions, and then sure. I want to move over because we have about 15 minutes left. I want to move over to questions uh, from the audience, some that were sent in, and then we'll go live. Great. So I think this is a real general question. The, the role of um, measurement data and analytics always seems to be under the spotlight even more during times of economic distress. Uh, we. 100% side after the financial crisis in 2008 for the next couple of years. Yep. I'm curious, how has the role of data and analytics changed during COVID? What what have you seen change and what do you think is going to change in the coming years now that we through this pandemic and the teams are um, the teams and the leagues are trying to figure out how to create that harmony and balance that they had with the advertising community that preceded COVID? Yeah, there's three things that I would highlight there. First is that data and the use of analytics is an imperative. Not that it wasn't before, but it's more important than ever. Um, because whereas like you're maybe doing little tweaks to get mm -hmm. impact, driving a 5% impact or a 30% impact. Now it's massive, the potential for it, because, and this is the second reason, we're at a situation where there is no precedent. Right. right? Historically, or generally, data is saying, okay, here's happened in the past, we're gonna use this information to predict the future. And in this day, in this situation, we don't know how people are going to react to coming back <clears throat> to this. We have indications that it's going to be very different, that the expectations mm -hmm. are going to be very different. We've been doing a bunch of research at Kager around the future of live events and sports. And we basically, as a give back and, and frankly, for our own understanding, created a fan demand index, web scraping a bunch of free available information around COVID factors. So like infection rate, now vaccination rate, um, unemployment, like what's happening in specific markets. Mm -hmm. And then what the, what the teams and organizations are doing to give people feel safe. And uh, we've been doing that basically since last April or May and it's been hugely beneficial. It's across 32 different markets, but mm -hmm. to give people an indication, because we're seeing if people in certain markets are going and eating at restaurants or um, or going uh, to buy things or going shopping and stuff like that, those folks or those markets are likely, there's likely a better indication that those people are gonna be willing to go to sporting events right. or concerts or whatever it might be. So we have to find net new data to try and understand what customers are going to be comfortable coming and how different from a personalization perspective, a young person who the impact of getting COVID would be significantly less versus a more seasoned tenured customer, what their experience to a game might need to be like to keep that fan. And that's actually a tremendous amount of the work that we are doing with our clients around changes to gate entry, for example, around even giving the, the part-time staff who work at the games comfort and what their experience is going to do. There's a lot of communication and education and personalization of, of customers mm -hmm. to understand and have the right messaging. So data is super imperative. The customer is changing. We're trying to find out in real right. time because we can we can do stuff more real time now. It doesn't have that long delay that we had, you know, even four years ago. And it needs to be more real time because the history is a shorter period of time because it's changing so much. The third and final component is that the amount of data, at least in large part as a result of the pandemic, has just accelerated massively. I mean, you know this, but I think for, for all the students, the key things around like something is such as mobile ticketing, where before the pandemic, you might have 30% of people using um, their, their mobile phone, their phone to get into a game. Now it's going to be virtually 100% in right. every single sports league. That is a massive amount of new information and insights and, and data that is coming. Additionally, cashless payments uh, for food and beverage. Like I personally am not gonna use my credit card. I'm gonna always be doing uh, cashless. And so ensuring that organizations, uh, venues have that, that's also a huge amount of information, so on and so forth. A lot more data is coming. So the ability to take that data, 
and understand what it means about the customer's experience, wants, needs, and apply it to, again, continuously improving the experience because the expectations are going to be different. So, you know, that is really, it's an imperative. Yep. It's without precedent and there's more data. That's why data and analytics is even more important now than it was before the pandemic. Right. The one thing that we talk about at Scout is how the fans have been reprogrammed, right? How their habits yes. are changing. That's exactly what you just talked about. So for example, right, we're never going to see a paper ticket anymore. That is going to live now with the teams. They're going to be able to monetize that, com commercialize that. You said you're not going to use a credit card anymore because you don't want to have that interaction. I'm thinking, okay, I move away from my credit card. What about all those Delta miles that I get? You know, when I travel throughout throughout the year for all the events we go to, is there a way to recapture those Delta miles? Like what partnerships are now going to be created so people are encouraged? So there's a lot that's changing. So my last question that I have real quick before we go to uh, student questions is, um, we both advise uh, teams and leagues, venues and events. We're trying to help them transform their business through advanced analytics and data. What's the one thing that they must do almost immediately as fans start to trickle back into live environments? Where, where's their focus over the next six months? Well, the, I'll start, I'll just say it in two ways. The okay. changes that have to be made, gate entry has to be addressed. People need to feel comfortable that they're not going to be waiting in line with tons and tons of people. Okay. Communication is the second most important thing. Being able to do that on an individualized level and having access to who your customers are, even when tickets are selling on the secondary, is super critical because it's going to be changing in real time because people are going to see what's happening and make adjustments. I think there'll be much more messaging, um, app notifications. Um, the, the, the last thing is feedback. The, right. the focus on getting feedback about what customers' experiences are and making changes you know, by the way, could during a game, I mean, it has got to be instant. People need to feel heard. If you have, because of what you what you said about uh, people's behaviors, the re reprogramming, people need to have a great first experience or it might prevent them or have in their head that they're not gonna be comfortable coming back. And so uh, organizations need to hear what the experience is and mm -hmm. they need to take action to fix it. Because the assumption is, you have to remember, many of these venues have been shut down for a year and a half. There's going to be things that don't work because it's been shut down. I have a long list of things that I can't wait to do when we start traveling and going back to events. One of the things that I want to do is I, I want to host you for lunch or dinner with a couple of my colleagues, with Scott and Harry and Karen. I love it. Uh, um, I, I just, you'll enjoy meeting them because... They're the ones that authored the research that, I, that Karen shared with you. So we're all thinking along the same lines. Okay, um, 10 minutes left. Let me open it up. Are there any students that have a question that want to jump in? We can do some live questions before I get to the written questions. They're so shy. Um, let's see, there's a pop open the chat here because I think there's something in the chat. Um, nope. Okay. If you have any questions for Jessica, just post them in questions tab on the right side of your screen. All right. While people are doing that, I'm going to go to a question that was submitted in advance. What's it like being a, a woman in sport and specifically in data analytics? What's, what's your favorite aspect about working in sports? I mean, I think it, I think it's a great opportunity to, I mean, a couple of things for me personally. Um, in the role and position that I'm in today to help um, educate the younger women in, in who are coming into the industry about that things are unequal still and kind right. of make sure that there's awareness of that um, is, is something that I think I really take pride in, in trying to um, ensure that people kind of know the challenges. Um, and not just the women, it's also the men so that they kind of can help support their peers. Um, and in the same respect, like helping the, the, the men who work for me who are in management positions identify when they have biases. Right. Um, 
you know, we all saw this year, especially with the Black Lives Matter situation, that there's um, there's social unrest, there's tremendous unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And so part of our jobs, I feel my responsibility is to increase people's awareness of those unconscious biases to ensure that there's more opportunities for women. Um, you know, me being a woman in sports and with analytics as a as a backbone has been a great opportunity because it's given me a voice that isn't just my voice, it's the voice of the customer. It's rooted in information. And that is something that can't necessarily be questioned. It's not just whoever speaks the loudest, although I do speak pretty loud having called plays in college as a point guard. But I think that there's there's backup for what I'm saying. And I do think that that's, uh, for me, been really validating and um, and I think impactful. Yeah, there's a, I'm glad you brought up the whole concept of unconscious bias because we've gone through so much training at our office. We have a company of you know 2000 plus. Um, there's this just tsunami uh, wave of information that, that's coming our way as we recognize um, all the things that we need to do to kind of create the gold standard as a media company. Um, so speaking of that, and, and I think we do a wonderful job in our organization with gen quality, we've been recognized uh, for the work that we do, um, uh, pushing women into leadership roles. We've, we've been recognized consistently in that capacity. And like I said, we have, we have work to do in other areas. But a question came through, as a woman in sports analytics industry, you've had firsthand experience of the discrimination that women face in this industry. What's one piece of advice you have for women trying to enter the field of sports? You mean in terms of the fact that you're going to likely face discrimination? Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think, I mean, Go ahead, I'm sorry. I, I mean, I guess what I would say is you gotta find what's genuine and real for you finding um, mentors, mm -hmm. uh, talking with people like your colleagues about what's happening is super important. Um, and it's okay to say like, no, that's not okay. Right. Um, and I think that it's hard, especially uh, as a young person to, to try and speak to that. It's very nuanced. I'm not suggesting it, it isn't. Um, but you gotta you gotta pick your battles, and this is a very different day today than when I was coming up in the sports industry. And um, I do think there is a heavy focus, you know, certainly by our organization uh, the, and the broader craft group, which is also a, a large company, um, on ensuring that um, there is uh, as much equality as possible in, in how we're doing our hiring. So oh, the the thing is, I guess I would say is like speak up if something is happening um, to you that you feel is inappropriate. That would probably be what, what I would say. Um, uh, because there are people who, who can listen and help. And I also think, and I'm again, I'm just coming from a business leader myself. I also think culture is critically important. So many people focus on the, the title of the company that you work for, but you have to spend time researching the culture of the company. Um, yeah. What are they doing about you know DEI and and how do they and how are they mentoring and coaching and, and nurturing and how are they giving people opportunities and so I, I I think I've seen in my career which which has been a, a long time now I've seen some friends make some mistakes by choosing companies because they thought it looked better on a resume but it was an environment that was just unhealthy uh, and they eventually moved on. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to say, like, I think it's important. We um, have, like, it, it was created in, internally um, and is led by some of the folks within our organization. But we have a, I think it's every month, it could be every two weeks, but I think it's every month, um, a DEI uh, kind of just, we read, read an article or a book and we get together and talk about it. And that's just like something I'm really proud of that uh, we took the, the, the situations and the social unrest um, you know, I personally addressed it very head on and asked if anything we could do. And that is one of the byproducts and it happened organically. And I'm just so, I'm so proud of our team for, for doing that. Time for one more question. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to find a question that we haven't really touched upon. There's a lot of really okay. great questions. I think we've answered a lot of them. Here's, here's a really good one. 
Uh, this past season was extremely difficult in terms of the teams and the leagues generating revenue with no fans being able to attend. So how has the season impacted your strategy for, for Kager moving, moving forward? Like what, what, what role are you now playing for your clients? How are you helping them re- recapture that revenue? Can you talk about that a little bit before we uh, sign off? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, we're trying to help our clients identify the uh, customer who might be less likely to return. We created what we're calling a COVID factor, which is actually, now I think about it, a terrible, uh, <laughs> a terrible <laughs> phrase. <clears throat> but we're, but we're applying that again to try and help where we people who maybe haven't been as mobile and going out in restaurant reservations, so that the um, organizations, teams can reach out to those customers and determine how they wanna be engaging them. We're also looking at the data that is available, which is there's a lot of season ticket members in this case who left their money on account for the next season. That tells Mm -hmm. you something versus the people who asked for refunds. So we're trying to use that type of information to help them with their planning of how many tickets they're gonna need to sell this year, because that is really a great unknown, not only in terms of the capacity, which is obviously moving more towards hopefully full capacity by the fall, but also like their ability to sell in is gonna be very different because people's, um, their ability and comfort in coming to games is still unknown. Really. Right. So um, that's been a very, very heavy focus. And the other component is the learnings around what do fans and customers need to feel and experience coming to sporting events. That's been a big focus. We're doing a tremendous amount of uh, research on, on gate entry, on flow patterns. Mm -hmm. And then we're also doing a lot of work with helping to identify um, the part-time staff to support the, the um, having venues at full capacity. I know that sounds like surprising, but these are people who had these jobs for, for years and they got used to doing them. They had to go and get other jobs. They're no longer working at those venues at a full-time capacity. So it isn't just like they can, you know, they just, click their, you know, snap their fingers and those people come back. So it's really interesting business challenges. And then the other thing is, how are we going to take the learnings from everything that's been happening digitally and social in terms of engagement and apply that to the in-venue experience and vice versa? And that's Mm -hmm. actually just super cool and really fun to think about. Jessica, we can do this for another hour, I'm sure, because there's more questions and there's a lot of things I'd love to ask you. But unfortunately, we need to move on and and share the stage with, with others. Um, but I can't thank you enough. And it really was a, a treat, I'm sure, for all the students that are listening to have the opportunity to hear you talk about your career, your journey, the contributions that you are making to sports. Um, I love learning myself. I hope you, know, you and I have created a, a friendship and a shared so. passion for data and analytics. And again, I want to thank um, all, the, uh, all the student leaders at UMass because you guys have done an incredible job. This is not easy at all. Uh, so you should all feel really good about yourself. With that, um, I think we're now going to sign off and turn it all back right. over to Thank everyone you, everyone. Else. Thanks, everybody. on the conference. Thanks, Emma. Jessica and Michael, thank you so much for being here. It has been an honor and a pleasure, and we appreciate you both taking the time out of your very busy days to join us today. And thank you all for attending our second keynote session of the McCormack Sport Leaders Forum. Next up, we'll have a 15 minute break followed by our first session of panels, which include new media and sports gambling. The new media panel will take place on AirMeet, which is the panel we're currently on, and the sports gambling panel will take place on Zoom. So make sure you check your email from this morning to have the Zoom link, and please let us know if you're having difficulty accessing it. It's important that you attend the session that you signed up for in your registration process, And thank you again to our title sponsor, Scout Sports and Entertainment, and to our keynote sponsor, PointsBet. Thank you so much for being here. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.